It's a chilly day in October. Okay. Hopefully you saw my email, but if you didn't, as per the instructions, I'm giving you a hard copy so you can look at the hard copy. So just to remind you, yes, you can uh, can turn your, uh, I've moved the date till next Monday for paper number one. So if you haven't done it, then you have until then to do it, please. And uh, if you have done it and already submitted it by the due date, then I, I'm giving an extra two points for those who did get it done early, or not, shouldn't say done early, but done on time. Hello, Ms. Kitty. Um, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, but just so you know that. Um, I guess that's all. Going back to, or coming back to Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm going to talk today about this gentleman, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. Blessed Carlos. Blessed Charles, Mr. DeRusso, yeah? Yes, sir. Okay, blessed Carlos. And I don't have to write his dates down because there are, well, actually, no, I do have to write his dates down. Well, we got that one there. Um, but he is a uh, Puerto Rican from Puerto Rico, Carlos Manuel Cecilio Rodriguez Santiago. This is his full name, if you're if curious. Born in 1918. They say, nine, yeah, they say 1918 there. 1918, and he died in 1963. 1963, so 1918 to 1963. As I said, he's Puerto Rican, born in Puerto Rico. Um... And so he's an American because Puerto Ricans, I forget which, when Puerto Ricans were given citizenship, they weren't immediately once we took over Puerto Rico. I want to say the 1940s or something. Um, someone wants to look it up for an extra credit point, you could and let me educate me. But um, eventually Puerto Ricans, all Puerto Ricans were given citizenship. So he became an American citizen, definitely. And uh, he was Catholic and apparently a good and holy man. He was a catechist. Catechism is basically, um, it's teaching. It's, it's from a Greek word where, yes. Yeah. 1917. Oh, I was totally off. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moose. <laughs> All right, let's see. What class is this? So, Ms. Murray, yes. You're the first one, Ms. Murray. I think I said it before and nobody took me up on it, but there you go. One extra credit point. Mm -hmm. What was it again? 1917, did you say? March, oh, March 2nd. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, oh, yeah, so definitely he was an American from birth then, because 1918, just the, the year after. So, yeah, okay. Always an American then. Um, not naturalized or brought in uh, through law. Um, anyways, he was born in Caguas in Puerto Rico, which I guess is a city in Puerto Rico. You have to look at a map to see where it is in Puerto Rico. Um, but um, anyways, he was a catechist. I'm trying, what was I trying to do? Explain what a catechist is. A catechist is basically a teacher, a teacher of the faith. Um, a teacher of religious doctrine as a catechist. Uh, he was also interested in liturgy, which we know about. Liturgy is the public worship of the church, or, you know, of any religion. You know, religions have public worship, which you can call liturgy. And he's the first Puerto Rican and the first Caribbean-born layperson in history to have been beatified. I guess before that, most of the New World saints or blesseds or whatever um, were like from religious orders or they were priests and stuff like that. And that's, that's kind of like the habit of the Vatican. You know, they tried to get away from that. Um, John Paul, Pope St. John Paul II tried to, he canonized a lot of saints and he tried to include a lot more lay people, people who were not monks or nuns or priests or bishops and stuff like that to show that holiness is for everybody. And uh, they've kind of gotten back into that rut at the Vatican where every time they come up with a new list of saints and people who are going to be, you know, beatified or saint sanctified, usually nuns and friars. <laughs> Every now and then, one of us will get in. But So he's a lay person. So it's notable that he is the first lay person, um, for, at least from the Caribbean, to be, to be beatified, declared blessed. He was a servant of God, then he was venerable, and then he was finally beatified, as you can see here, in 1997. And he's hopefully on his way to canonization. They're, I guess they're waiting for another miracle. Um, he wanted to become a priest. 
but he uh, he was too ill to do that. He had a, a bad sickness that didn't enable him to make it through the, the rigors of going to the seminary. Um, so, you know, he just took a, a regular job as any person does. Um, he was an office clerk. And he dedicated his, his resources to promoting a greater knowledge of the faith, the Catholic faith that he believed in. And also, a sp he was distinctive because he had a real love, as I said, for the liturgy and for Christian worship. Um, and he wanted it to be done right and done appropriately. Uh, and so he, he tried to um, promote that and inculcate that in people. Um, he spoke English, so he would translate things, uh, presumably from Spanish uh, or English into Spanish and vice versa, uh, especially on the liturgy. And he began publishing, um, I guess, a, a magazine or something called Liturgy in Christian Culture. He organized discussion groups across the island and uh, trying to disseminate his ideas, especially about the liturgy, getting it to be practiced more appropriately because, you know, at that time when he was growing up, not maybe, well, he died in 63, so there were changes coming in 63, but through most of his life, the liturgy was not in the language anyone understood. It was in the dead language, Latin, um, which is a nice language, but, you know, if you understand it. <laughs> But, you know, most people didn't. I mean, they understood the responses at the liturgy. The, the responses are pretty simple, and you can figure out what the responses are. Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. I mean, after you say that a few hundred times, you know what it means, even though it's in Latin. Hello, sir. Mr. Mish? Yes, good. Um, you know what it means. So it's, it's not you know, beyond the pale, that people actually did understand what they were doing at Mass. But but the prayer, once you got into, like, the prayers or readings and stuff that was beyond people, then no. Sometimes even the priests didn't know, um, even though they had to study Latin in the seminary. Um, and the, Latin, the seminary was taught in Latin, too. All the books were in Latin up until uh, around the 50s or 60s. Uh, so he was arguing more for, you know, have it in the language of the people that pe so people could understand what the prayers were saying. And then they can zone out, you know, <laughs> rather than not understanding at all and zoning out. You know, at least they can, uh, our father who are now. Okay. You've never been to a Catholic Mass before? Anyway, all right, fine. Um, and that's the priest. Anyways, but um bum yeah. So we wanted changes like that. And they also did weird stuff like that. They would anticipate things. Like they would, during Holy Week and stuff like that, like the Easter Vigil, which a vigil is supposed to be held in the evening, the, they would hold it in the morning and stuff like that. Mainly because people weren't able to come because of work. So they would hold it. Uh, the whole liturgy, the weird times, like times of day when the liturgy wasn't supposed to be held, like a morning liturgy in the evening. and So, so he was trying to, to change stuff like that. Um, and so he also taught catechism, as I said. He taught the faith to high school students, and he promoted Catholic liturgy amongst the bishops, the clergy, and the lay people. Um, in, uh, do I have a year here? In 1963, he was diagnosed with rectal cancer. Ooh, that's got to hurt. That's... It's kind of a bad cancer. That's, I mean, they're in that, all cancer is nasty, but that, you know, all right. He's so diagnosed with rectal cancer um, following an operation, and he died rather quickly, actually, the same year at the age of 44. He died a relatively young man, middle-aged. So there's a picture of him, an actual picture. Oh, Blessed Carlos, and I ask you your prayers, Blessed Carlos. Especially as, you know, we have a hurricane in that region of the world that hit Florida on Wednesday. I don't think it's going to hit... Puerto Rico or affect Puerto Rico very much, but nevertheless, I ask for your prayers, Blessed Carlos, that people will be safe in Florida from Hurricane Milton. Amen. Oh, I got that. I'm going to write for that. The Shema. Yes. Okay, I'm coming to that. I'm glad I marked my page. Hi, <laughs> righty. Oh, Mr. Mish, there's uh, a paper. Oh, let me give it to you now. Did anyone else come in? I think it was just Mr. Mish. Oh, Miss Kenny, yeah. Ooh, Mr. Mish, is that coffee? Yeah, yeah. ice coffee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crystal. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, I was talking about uh, the summarizing, if we could summarize Jesus's 
teaching on the kingdom of God, what does it come down to? And we read from the Gospel of Mark because I wanted to uh, talk about this thing called the Shema that Jesus uh, uses to explain what the essence of his teaching is. And he makes the connections explicitly with the kingdom of God. So that's why it's important. The other gospel writers don't necessarily make that same connection that Mark does. So I'm just going to talk briefly about this and we'll move on to the next uh, part of the lecture, Who is Jesus? Come on. Whoops, there we go. The Shema. What is the Shema? Here's your definition. Comes from the Hebrew word I told you already, but there it is in the PowerPoint. Shema, which means to hear. Shema, let's see if I can remember the beginning of it. Um, Shema Yisrael um, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Okay. And then uh, I'm not Jewish, so I don't uh, I didn't learn Hebrew. Well, I did take Hebrew in graduate school, but not very good at it. But, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being, with all your mind. You are to, um, you know, place these words, wear them like a jewel on your forehead. You are to bind them to your hand. Um, take these words and place them on the doorposts of your and gates of your homes and stuff like that. So it's a very famous statement of faith amongst Jews, recited every day by faithful Jews. Um, so it's a core statement of their belief in the oneness of God. Here, Israel, there is only one God. The Lord is the Lord alone, and that he has a special relationship with Israel. He's your Lord. He's Israel's God. Okay, so here it is. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 is where this comes from. Moses. This is what I basically summarized for you. Chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love him, okay, with your whole heart, your whole being, your whole strength. Teach these words that I command you to your children, okay? Recite them when you are at home and when you are away. So Jew, faithful Jews do that. They recite them every day. Um, when you get up in the morning, you're supposed to recite them, bind them on your arm as a sign, wear them as a jewel on your forehead, write them on the doorposts of your houses. Okay, there you go. So Jesus quotes from this, okay? This is, he identifies this as the core, the heart of his preaching as well, the heart of the Jewish religion. Jesus is a Jew. I mean, big surprise, you know, big shock. He quotes the Shema, or at least the opening words of the Shema. Um, but he adds to it as well, and this is a very Jewish practice of exegesis and kind of inter biblical interpretation, is that if you ask a rabbi for a question, you know, and the, the rabbi will usually take something from this part of Scripture, Scripture, something from that, something from there in the scriptures, and kind of tie them all together and say, okay, this is the answer, you know? Kind of putting different texts together into a kind of a mosaic in a way. So it's a very Jewish way of interpreting the Bible. And Jesus does the same thing. He now gives an, an, a further interpretation of this essential core principle of loving God and being devoted to God, but also loving humans. Because if you can't love people, like this is... This, the letter of James says this in the New Testament. If you can't love people whom you can see, how can you love God whom you can't see? You know, <laughs> see, you know? it's like, anyways. Um, whoops. So loving neighbor. Jesus adds to it from the book of Leviticus, which is a totally different book. It's in another place in the Torah, but it's also from the Law of Moses. So we have two quotations from the Law of Moses. First, the Shema in Deuteronomy, and then from the book of Leviticus, which is a book that's mainly um, concerned with the priesthood and, and temple service, but it also has a lot of rules and regulations about how to live a Jewish life. And in one of those places, it says this. Leviticus 19.18, take no revenge and cherish no grudge against your own people. You shall love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. <laughs> it's like that's, you know, it means it's really serious. This is, it means that what's coming before that is a really serious commandment because God is putting his own name behind it. He's letting, like putting his signature on it. I am Yahweh, Lord, okay? I am the Lord. So you have to do this. Um, 
which maybe you you know you've heard that maybe many times and not maybe haven't thought about it so deeply, although maybe you have. Um, but we have to consider what a neighbor is, and that's a question, okay? Um, because Jesus doesn't define necessarily what a neighbor is, but it kind of does here, if you notice, Mr. Tross. A grudge against your own people. Yes, your own people. So that kind of qualifies what we mean by a neighbor. Okay, The word neighbor simply means one who lives nearby you. Okay, They're near you, all right? a neighbor. Um, so basically anyone who's close to you. But especially close because they're part of your, your tribe, your group, the Israelites, your, your fellow Jew. So, I mean, does that mean that Jews could hate those who weren't fellow Jews or of their own people? No, I mean, that doesn't mean they could violate the Ten Commandments. They could, you know, lie, cheat, and steal from the Gentiles, but they couldn't do it to Jews. No, they still had to follow the law of God. But there were, there were supposed to treat their own people differently in a special relationship because they were part of that special community of God. Um, so it had a, kind of a restrictive interpretation. But Jesus doesn't give it that restrictive interpretation. When he says neighbor, he means all people, not just fellow Jews, but also non-Jews. Not just people who love you, but people who hate you, your enemies as well. Which that makes no sense to anybody. You know, because, I mean, logically, you should hate your enemies. You should wish them ill, shouldn't you? Shouldn't you? No? Why? Who says no? Mr. Trost, why shouldn't you hate your enemy? I don't know what they're going through in these rats fire. They might envy you, and that's why they might actually like, be the worst. They're trying to ruin you. So that's what I'm trying to do. Don't hate them? Trying to harm you, hurt you, kill you? Well, it might be in self-defense. If you, if they try to kill you, then. But but when you kill them, don't hate them while you're killing them. Yeah. When you're defending yourself. No, that's yeah. no, it's no, that's true. That's you. Know, you can. That's. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. You might have to defend your life, but you don't have to hate the person. Yeah, they're wrong. So I'm not right. They don't. You make you feel good though. Or <laughs> <laughs> so how about what? But technically, if you think about it like this, if you kill somebody and they kill you, hey, you're just getting yourself with the senses. So they could then they're responsible for you or death and the person that you kill. Okay. So cool. yeah, it's not a right if you kill it. Okay. I understand that. I'm just trying to think, it doesn't seem logical to me, especially if you're living in a tribal society and you've got limited resources and you have another group or another person who's trying to take those resources from you, take food out of your mouth, take food out of your children's mouth, even to harm you, to attack you, to take the stuff that you have so they can have it, that you're not going to... But what if you don't know if they might have a little ant resource and you will have to try to take it and they'll kill them with your resource? You really don't know what they're doing. Maybe you don't have their skill. But I would say that... Oh, go ahead. Um, I think that it's not our place to judge, it's God's place to judge, so we shouldn't be the ones placing that judgment. Making that judgment? Yeah, it should be left up to that. And that's okay. why we should love our neighbor. So while you're, you're not making that judgment, what do you do? Try to make the best choice that you can make within the situation, I guess, but then ask for forgiveness. Okay. So you watch the other tribe or the other group come in, slaughter your children, your no, family, take your stuff. I would slaughter them. Slaughter them. <laughs> yeah. But then I would ask them for forgiveness. Oh, okay. So, oh, so you can you can hate, but ask for forgiveness. That's Just fine. you know, ask for forgiveness. I'll hate now. That's a tough situation. It's an area. Yeah, but it's a normal yeah. situation. I mean, if you were living a few thousand years ago, it's kind of a normal situation. Right. Well, it's a normal situation now. People want other people's stuff. Yeah, go ahead and just. Uh, well, you kind of already said it, but I just want to say I think that everything um, depends on the context of the situation. In the situation that you're talking about, if you were to retaliate in that given situation, I don't think that it would mean that you hate the other party. I think it's just your kind, your hand is forced. So I don't think I think you're still loving your neighbor. You just had the force control. Like if someone's slaughtering their family, 
you have no choice but to defend yourself and maybe you in a, mal a malicious way, but it's not intentional. And I think God takes intent within everything when he's making and he's observing your, uh, observing your choices. He's thinking about your intent as well. So I think context matters within every situation. What about... Uh... Really about that. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, it's, I would just imagine God does take your intent and why you're doing it. Um, should you wish you could have built it? What is that? You like the car. What kind of car? Uh, I have a value as you go to. It just, oh, it's oats and honey. Yeah, it's nice. It's tasty. I don't know. Yes. I'm trying to see it. Takes your own into account, especially if we're saying, like, you know, you can protect yourself and not be them, you can protect yourself and not want them to be armed, but you, know, you just have to do it to protect yourself. And it's more like if you're doing it because you do them. That's bad intention at first. They're doing it because you're trying to do it again. That's it. There's a big difference. Okay. I really think people in conflict with our words. God being here gives each father, but we've flown and fighting back because, like, hates him because, you know, so we do so we don't hate his father, but he's defending them with the father. Okay. Yeah. So it's not in your self-interest to try to neutralize someone who's trying to harm you. don't think so? It's not in your self-interest? Wipe out your competitors? So that you have all the stuff, or they can't, at least they can't take it away from you? I mean, obviously, you know, the last thing I want to do is kill someone. If I'm trying to do that, I Sure. You, you remember, of course, that we live in a country with, like, thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at other countries. <laughs> you know, that's not love. I don't know what is. Yeah. <laughs> don't mess with us or we'll kill you. I mean, our military doesn't take that logic. CIA doesn't take that logic. We have kill lists. At least our president does. They don't call it that. <laughs> I think in the beginning, when the, under, uh, what's his name, President Eisenhower, I think it was, they call it the health readjustment plan. <laughs> For, for those elements in the world who are seeking to do harm to us, enemies. And, and we actively went out and assassinated them. I mean, well, Israel's doing that right now when they're, they're looking at us, right? Well, we're trying to kill the leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah to wish them harm. They're enemies. But okay, you know, we should love... The, the, I'm just saying that, you know, there is an argument against what Jesus is saying. There are some people who might argue that that's not a good thing. That's not in your self-interest to love even people who are your enemies. Because then look what happened to Jesus. He didn't defend himself against his enemies, people who were trying to do him harm. Okay, well, I just... Food for thought. Because, I mean, it helps you, I think, when you read the Bible, because, and other cultures, because you'll, you, if you do a little reading into other cultures, and, and the Bible is very much another culture, different time frame, um, people didn't think like that. I, I, per, what I think, I mean, I'm not judging, I'm not judging anybody, but this is my impression is that our culture is so imbued with the teachings of Jesus, whether we believe in Jesus or not, just even our, in our Western, what we call our Western values, you know, like like people in Asia don't believe in freedom or something. Like that. I don't know. But anyways, um, but what we call you know Western liberal values of you know having concern for the other person, even if the person is your opponent, that you don't do harm to them. Okay, um, those seem very Christian to me, or at least Judeo-Christian. And if you read the Bible, that was not all, that's not how they viewed it. I mean, the Israelites had to defend themselves and they attacked other people who were not part of their tribe. If you were not part of my tribe, you were my enemy. Um, I, I know this firsthand from having lived for nine months in Papua New Guinea, which is a very tribal society. 
Stone Age society until the 1930s when the Australians went digging for gold and they discovered millions of these people living in the, in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. They didn't even know they were there. Um, and they had they were literally Stone Age. They had never developed any kind of metallurgy or anything like that. They were still using stones and wood and stuff like that. Um, and they're tribal. They're still tribal to this day. There still are tribal wars over territory and land. So, you know, our ancestors lived here. You're not part of our tribe, therefore you don't have the, deserve the right to live here. And anyone from outside the tribe is an enemy. And you kill them. Now, you don't can't kill everybody from the outside. You might want, want some people to come in. So you build up what's called a man house. A man house, which is a special, they develop this kind of halfway system where if a, a stranger comes into the village, well, you can't have the stranger in the village because the person's foreign. They're, they're an outsider. So you put them in the man house, and that way they're safe. Because otherwise they might get killed. Because they're not you. They're not your group. And the Jews had, if you read especially in the Old Testament, and even the time of Jesus, people had that kind of view. You're not part of my group, therefore you are an enemy, therefore I hate you, I stay away from you, etc. Jesus says to his, his followers not to do that, and that's why it was so radical. Even those who want to harm you. So, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Can I move on now, or uh, do I? All right. Let's see what my next. Let's surprise myself. Love of God and neighbor. Okay. Well, I just already told you that. Um. Oh, and that's the end. Okay. So just to summarize, and then I'll move on to who Jesus is. Um. What I said before, Jesus is a Jew. He draws on the Torah. He draws on the Jewish law for his teaching. He's not changing that, but he does reinterpret it. So he's not creating something new. He's not breaking with Judaism in a way. He's just reinterpreting it and fulfilling it according to his own twist, his own interpretation. Neighbor meant a fellow Israelite in the common understanding. Again, that didn't mean the Jews could do evil to non-Jews. Non but it meant that you favored your own people. But Jesus redefines it to include even those who wish you harm and are your enemies, those who hate you or otherwise wish you harm. And by implication, that would include non-Jews, people who are not part of the group. And Jesus demonstrates this by, at times, um, hanging out with Gentiles or interacting with Gentiles during his ministry. Not often, but he does do it. His mission was mainly to the people of Israel. And so this is what the kingdom of God should look like. Love of God and love of neighbor. Very simple. Um, and this is even more important as the scribe says to Jesus and Mark. He says, the scribe actually goes on and says, yes, master, this is even more important than all the sacrifices we can offer in the temple. You know, all the good religious deeds we can do in worshiping God. And Jesus is, loves him, you know, looks at him and loves him because he answered with understanding. He realized that Jesus isn't rejecting the temple. He's not saying, oh, yeah, go tear it down. You know, don't go to church on Sunday. God, you don't need to go to church. Just be good to people, you know. No, he wasn't destructive in, in that sense. But he was like, yeah, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're on the right track. And notice how it, the story ends. No one dared ask Jesus any more questions. <laughs> there was a, something about that just surprised, shocked. They were like, ooh, wait, wait a second. <laughs> they didn't even want to ask him anything more for what he they were worried he might say. Okay, who was this man? talked about what he talked about what he talked about and some of the things that he did but who was this dude called Jesus of Nazareth yes uh, and hopefully you've been doing the readings and the syllabus you've read this but if not we're gonna go over it anyway so buckle up <laughs> While the Gospels are extremely important, and we'll learn this later when I give you a, an introduction to the Bible, Mr. Marita, you already know this, um, the Gospels are extremely important. They were not written first. The stories of Jesus were not written down first, actually. Um, the, uh, the letters of Paul were. So Paul's letters were written between 50 and 65 A.D. Did I put that in the 
sometime between 50 AD and 65 is when this man Paul of Tarsus wrote letters to various Christian communities throughout the Mediterranean basin and uh, and these are our, really our first testimonies to Christianity, our earliest documents we have of Christianity, not the Gospels. The first Gospel that's believed to have been put down in writing is the Gospel of Mark. And scholars don't think that was written until like the mid-60s. So Paul was already writing. Writing letters, um, you know, at least a decade or so before the mid-60s, before the Gospel of Mark. Not that they weren't telling stories about Jesus, it just wasn't written down yet, okay? Um, but if we want to kind of go beyond, you know, before the time before the Gospels and get to like, what were Christians saying about Jesus before the Gospels kind of like got, the official story got written down? Go to Paul's letters. Or many of Paul, most of Paul's letters. Some of them were Scholars don't think we're written by Paul, but many of Paul's letters, okay? Um, you can also go to the Acts of the Apostles, but, you know, that's, uh, that was written later. But it includes some earlier traditions as well. But I'm going to Paul's letters. And one, this letter from the letter to the Philippians um, was written by, scholars believe, by the man Paul, or at least dictated by Paul to a secretary, because he, you know... Um, a lot of times people would dictate stuff. Um, they wouldn't necessarily write it themselves. Um, and this was written anywhere between 54 and 58 AD, which I did not put on the PowerPoint. Again, well, I give myself something to do. Between 54 and 58 AD is when scholars date this letter. How do they do that? Well, from various internal statements in the letter. Um, some other historical details like, you know, Paul's journeys and where he was, like when did Paul end up in Philippi and bring the gospel there. So, you know, he kind of extrapolate which, by which date he must have written this letter. He obviously had to have founded the church in Philippi first before he uh, sent a letter to this church in Philippi. Um, and within this letter in chapter 2, we actually have even earlier testimony. Paul preserves for us a hymn, a song about Jesus that Christians were singing apparently during their liturgies um, within the context of the hymn. So now we have something even earlier than Paul's letter because he didn't make it up apparently. At least maybe there's some scholar who thinks he does. But most think it's no, it's genuine. This is earlier tradition that Paul is taking. So Paul's writing in the mid 50s and this like this we're going back into the 40s maybe. Uh, well, probably, I should say. We could be even going earlier, back into the 30s, depending on when this hymn was composed. Um, so he's indicating traditions that predate the written Gospels and certainly predate his letters. Okay. Um, actually, I want to show you where Philippi is. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. How are we doing, Mr. Multi? You with me? I got you still? Okay. Okay. Wait, we don't have a... I have to remember because I don't think there's a, a city there anymore. They're just ruins. I don't think they still have a city of Philippi in Greece. Um, but if I remember correctly, my geography... Here's the Greece... Uh, Philippi was in this region here, in northern, like northeastern Greece. Okay, I might actually have a picture on one of my PowerPoint slides, but anyways, of the ruins. Do I? No. That's all right. Anyways. So he, uh, Paul was writing to a Christian community there, and Paul's letters, you know, are mostly dealing with problems, just like I, I think I mentioned with church councils before. You know, usually councils come about in the church because there are problems, you know. Someone's questioning something that the church has always believed or thought she always believed, and now we have to have, a, uh, the bishops have to come together and decide what, what do they think. And the same thing with Paul. Usually there were pro problems, some serious problems in the communities that he was already in Christian communities that he was addressing. Not so much with the Philippians, though. The, the scholars call the letter to the Philippians, Mr. Bean, the letter of joy. 
because Paul keeps using the word rejoice. I am joyful in you because apparently there weren't very many problems amongst the Philippians. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing as Christians. So he was very happy with them. Okay, and in the midst of this letter, he cites a hymn, which I don't give you on the PowerPoint, but if you want to go to the letter of Philippians, you can read it for me. If you don't mind. La -da -da -da, Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2. Mm. Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 Verse 6. Anyone got it? Anyone want to read it for me? Anybody? Go ahead, Mr. Fiorentino. Actually, hold, Mr. Fiorentino, I'm sorry. Could you start with verse 5, please? Thanks. Same as. Right, Jesus. Who though, who though he wasn't in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grudged. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness. And found human, found human in appearance, he humbled himself, coming of the to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him, and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every name should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every time we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God's Father. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Okay, so this is called the Christ Hymn by Scholars. Let's start with verse 6 where it opens up. Because um, he just launches into this. That's why I wanted to have him, Mr. Fiorentino, start with verse 5. Because um, Paul is just talking to him. He says, let each of you look not only into his own interests, but the interests of others. Have the same mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he launches into this little hymn, this extract from a hymn. Who, though he was in the morphe of God, morphe, Okay, did not regard something, did not regard his equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to. Morphe is an interesting Greek word because um, you can see here what the meaning is the form, a shape, or a figure. You know, we use this in English, we say someone, you know, like the Transformers morph into different, you know, morph from cars into beings and stuff like that, robots and things. Um, so we have that same meaning that we took from Greek and, and English and our slang, I guess you could say, to morph into something. Um, morphology is another word for grammar. It's how words change the forms of different words in a, in a language. So morphe. So Jesus has the figure of God, the shape or form of God, um, which tells us something that his, about his essential character. His essential character is godly. Because he's in the morphe, he's not in the appearance of God. He has a godlike divine existence. He's not merely human. But he's not exactly God either, as you can see from the hymn. Because he's not, it doesn't just simply say, well, Jesus is divine, Jesus is God. It says he's in the form of God. He has the, the morphe that God has. And, and this is a, a you know, recurring uh, idea you'll see within the hymn about um, he's divine, but he's, he's more than human because he lowers himself. He's not merely a human person or a human being because he lo lowers himself. He becomes a slave, interpreted to mean that he comes in human form. Well, where is he coming from? Only well, really one other option if you're a Jew because there's the world and then there's the realm where God lives. You know, God has his house above the world, you know. There are different levels to it. There are levels to heaven, but God has his seat above the waters that surround the world. The only other place possibly would be the underworld, Sheol. Okay, but I doubt he's going to Sheol because that's where the dead go, <laughs> you know. Um, no, he's coming from someplace. Where is he coming from? He's not coming out of his mother's womb. So already you see that Christians are talking about Jesus at a very early stage as if Jesus is more than human, even godlike. 
but yet he's distinct from God. He's somehow different from God. And they don't seem to have this figured out yet. Um, the word that's translated as seized or something to be grasped, it says Jesus did not see his form of godliness as something to be grasped onto, is the Greek word harpagmos, or from the Greek harpazo, to see, snatch away, to steal like a thief. Okay, so they like, give it to me, you know? It kind of gives you the sense of what the, the hymn is going after. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, oh, Jesus didn't think he was God. He didn't think that was, that was, he could be as high as God. It doesn't make any sense if he's in the form of God. Um, that he doesn't think somehow he, Jesus himself would not think that's something, his equality with God, or that he is equal with God, something to be grasped. It would seem like a contradiction. No, it, what it's saying is that he didn't view his equality as something that he was stealing. He was taking without right from God. It was due him. It was due him. It was something that he didn't seize it from God and make himself a God. He is God in some way. Jesus enslaves himself, however. He, he becomes a slave to human flesh, to the human condition. So these things of suffering, hunger, wanting, even death, Jesus when he enters into humanity, he becomes fully human. He doesn't become partially human, like, you know, like he's some kind of superhero that, yeah, he's human, but he's kind of like Superman. You can't really kill him, you know? There's nothing you really can do to Superman or Spider-Man. It kind of, for me, makes all those superhero movies kind of like, I don't know, anticlimactic. Because it doesn't matter what kind of superhero they are. You can't kill them. You can't dirt them, basically. Oh, yeah, they get a little bit of blood here and there in their face. For the most part, you know, like, even... Total people who are not Superman, like the guy, what's his name? The doctor who's Iron Man, right? Well, I forget his name. Doctor, so. Hmm. Maybe I should just talk to you, sir. Yes, you would be. <laughs> but he's a human being, but he's a genius, right? And he's a billionaire, and he creates this equipment that he can put on, and he becomes Iron Man, and nothing can hurt him. That's not the case with Jesus. Jesus willingly enslaves himself to humanity, which includes being hurt, being open to suffering, and ultimately death. So, the one who is like God now becomes human. He's lowered. The, word, the Greek word, did I put that on that? Yeah, it's homoioma. This is verses 7 through 8 that he came in the resemblance or the similarity of a human. Okay? So again, that, again, he doesn't, now he's in the morphe of God, interestingly enough. But he doesn't use morphe for the humanity of Jesus. It's homo, homoioma, homoioma, or excuse me, homoioma, spit it out, Dr. Dunn, um, which also might be translated as likeness, because homoios in Greek means to be like something or similar. So you might he's in the likeness of humanity. Now you have to understand that correct again, there's no explanation what that means. Does that mean Jesus was not really fully 100 percent human? He was like just a God who is posing as a human? Um, it doesn't say. So that has to be thought about. And there actually will be questions about that in the early church. Um, what does that mean that Jesus was in the likeness of a human being? Um, but nevertheless, it shows that difference, that difference, that he is human, but he's not, he's not solely human. So how is his existence defined? What is the purpose of Jesus? Who is he? Well, he's the obedient, he's the obedient servant of God. Okay, he humbles himself and becomes obedient to accepting the consequences of his teaching, which might include, in his case, include death. Um, he's killed for his teachings or for his actions based on his teachings. And he's fully obedient to God. He will not lash out at his enemies. He will not defend himself. He will accept the consequence of what they're going to do to him. There's no, so it mentions his death. It mentions the cross, um, which might be a later addition to the hymn. That might be Paul's addition. He mentions the cross. But God has lifted Jesus up, exalted him. The, the word in Latin means exactly that, to lift up. Or also in Greek, I think, to lift up. He's been lifted up. So it doesn't, it doesn't explicitly talk about the resurrection, 
but it does um, imply this by Jesus' exaltation. He's raised, being raised, lifted up to a higher level, even than he had before, if that's possible. Because if he's godlike, what's above that? You know, Because <laughs> the Greek is really emphatic about it. He is like super raised. He's raised up even higher, you know? Well, you know, it's a it's a song, so you know it's poetic. So I wouldn't I wouldn't take it too literally, but you know it's it's uh, it's a love language. So people are maybe stating more than they want to state. But basically, the idea is the same: that Jesus is being lifted, being shown, being in a sense, he's being confirmed by God for what he is. That put that on the yeah, so to lift up and elevate, but even higher. You know, even it's hoops all, you know, lift them up even higher. Um, but look, notice how the hymn ends. Oh, if it is the end of the hymn, the hymn could go on forever. I don't know. But the, the, how it ends in Paul's letter, that because God has done this to Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee bends. Okay, which is a sign of reverence, could be homage. Like you might bend your knee in front of a ruler or something. Bend your knee before God, of course, a God. Um, but every knee will now bend to Jesus. Where? Not just on earth. In heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. Sheol, the underworld. So everywhere, the realm of God, the underworld, including the earth, every knee shall bend. Does that include God's knee? Hmm, no, no, hmm. No, probably not. God doesn't adore himself. God loves himself, but... Um, but anyways, it, it tells you something about now the importance of Jesus for Christians. He's given universal lordship and authority. But this is always done, and he's called Lord. Lord, this uh, word master, it simply means master, but it's most often used by Jews of God himself. He's called the Lord, because you don't pronounce the name of God, so you say the Lord instead. So the fact that Jesus, now this epithet for God, is being applied to Jesus specifically, and they mean more than just master or ruler or whatever, um, that's also an, in, an interesting indication of what's going on in the minds of Christians at this early stage. But this is always to the glory of God the Father. There's always that distinction. God is his Father. Jesus is not 100% no, identifiable with God. He's somehow different. There's a distinction, but they haven't worked it out yet. Still early days. Okay. So that tells us something about how early Christians thought. Another place we can look is in Colossians. Now, where's Colossae? That I forget. I forget where Colossae is. Let me look. There's Colossae, but where is it? It's in Turkey. I thought it was in Greece. All right. Interesting. I learned something new. The letter to the Colossians. So here you see in, as we could say, southwestern Turkey, we have here the city or the ancient city of Colossae where there was a Christian community. There are a whole bunch of Christian communities along this route. There's a road that goes through here. Um, and like if you read the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, there are a whole bunch of letters the, the book opens with a whole bunch of short letters to various churches around this ro uh, that are on this road, um, which gives us an indication of where the person might have been who wrote the book of Revelation, namely in this area of Turkey. But Colossae, the letter to the Colossians, Paul writes, we, we think, it's about... I'd say it's maybe 50-50 among scholars about whether this is a, a legitimate letter of Paul or not. There are many New Testament scholars who say it's not. It's written by maybe a disciple of Paul, someone who shared his ideas and wrote in his name. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but there are also a number of scholars who uh, think that Paul did write this letter. 
or even change their mind because because it's all about language you know I wasn't there so I wasn't watching who was writing actually writing the letter but and Paul used secretaries so they would you know a secretary would write down what you said but the secretary would also correct grammar and add statements to clarify and so you know you get the what the person said but the secretary was there also to to help you it was to assist you not just literally dictate everything you say and Paul you secretaries um, so the language is a little bit different in some ways than other letters that we think come from Paul um, people can't write in a different way you know it's like it's, it's it goes with the like the 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 prejudice or the bias I think of the interpreter if they don't think it's by Paul then you can find all sorts of things in the language to pick apart and say Paul doesn't really use that word a lot in Romans but he uses it a lot here in Colossians all right well you know so he uses it a lot in the letter to the Colossians but he doesn't use this word in the letter to the Romans if you have to write absolutely everything the same way I mean yes people do have a certain style that you can identify sometimes but um, unnecessarily. And if there's a scribe involved or a secretary, then that makes it even a little bit more dubious. So I don't have a problem believing this is by Paul. Nevertheless, nevertheless, if it's by Paul, it dates to 50. Sometime around 50 AD, the letter to the Colossians. If it's not by Paul, if it's somebody else in the name of Paul, it could be, you know, 80 AD. A good guess. So 50 to 80 AD when the letter to the Colossians was written. And like the letter to the Philippians, um, we do see whoever wrote the letter, I think it's Paul, I don't have a, at least through a secretary possibly, um, because I wasn't there. Um, whoever is writing this letter does also seem to be quoting a primitive Christian hymn, just like in Philippians. So now, so whatever, you know, whenever it was written, we're, we're definitely getting earlier tradition than 80 AD or 50 AD. And it possibly had a, a, an origin in Christian worship, but the, the song incorporates certain ideas from Jew, Jewish wisdom literature, you know, like talking about God's wisdom, his knowledge, his governance of the world, and um, this idea that wisdom is like an assistant to God as well, almost like a personified thing that helps God in the creation of the world. Um, would anyone like to read this from Colossians? If you have your Bible still open. It comes right after Philippians. Chapter 1, right? Yeah, it's chapter one. Is no. We lost Mr. Trost, Miss Sembalak. Come back, Mr. Trost, please. Who would like to uh to do it? Miss no, I got you. Oh, actually, Miss Double, do you mind Mr. Means, does it? I'm Egan, but he can read it again. Uh, Egan. Yes, Mr. Noble's behind you. Sorry about that, Ms. Egan. No, that's okay. All right, go ahead, Mr. Means. He delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him we created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he himself might be preeminent. For him in all fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace by blood of his cross. Through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, where am I? Okay. So Paul is, I forget if there are any problems in Colossae. I think there were some issues, some questions that he had to answer. But anyways, um, beginning with what was it again? verse 13, yes. Um, so again, the context, Paul is just saying, he says, he's giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified you, the Colossian Christians, to share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones in light. Okay, the saints in light. What does that mean? Like maybe it means Christians who have already died, who have already in the light, the light-filled presence of God, this image of light. 
And then he launches into this hymn that he that he knows, this fragment of a hymn. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. God has done this and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So we see a little switch here now. It's not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of Jesus as well. The kingdom of Jesus as well. Um, and then he, launched, he says, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So he states the purpose of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is apparently a sin offering. So in Philippians, Jesus is the obedient servant who goes to death according to the will of God. In Colossians, the hymn emphasizes the forgiveness of sins which is brought about. So he's a sin offering. He's a sacrifice in some way. He is the image of the invisible God. Okay, so here we get something interesting. Um, well, actually, I put that Ketise, um, the firstborn of all creation. Well, I got that. Anyways, um, he's called the image, and humans are images of Christ. Okay, because when you go, when you read like the book of Genesis, the opening book of of the Jewish Bible, the Jewish scriptures, God creates a man and he creates a woman in his image and likeness, in his image and likeness. So, I mean, human beings aren't gods. We want to be gods, but... <laughs> uh, uh. Or at least we want to be in control like a god. Um, but Jesus is in the image of God. Okay, humans, he's also in the image of God. Um, of the invisibility of the invisible God. So we can see the invisible God through the visibility of Jesus in the flesh. He's also described as a creature. Now that's a dangerous word, you know, katise in, in Greek, which means a creature is something that's created. He's the firstborn of creation. So he's the first thing that comes out of creation. Um, that's going to cause some problems, as we'll, as we'll see when we talk later on about um, the Trinity and God. That's going to cause some problems in the Christian church, because what does that mean that Jesus is a creature? Um, he's God, yes. There was never any real question about that within Christianity from the early days. Was he made God, though? He's a katise, he's a creature. Was he made into a God? Um, was he born a human being? Like he's a, but then he was divinized in some way. You know, how is that? You know, did God, was he created a God before his exist, you know, existence as a human and then he became a human? Okay, God in the appearing in the flesh, or was he a human being already, and then God just divinized him or something? Katise, that's we don't know because we don't we don't know what the Christians were thinking when they were singing this. But um, I mean, Christianity will later reinterpret this or interpret this to mean that Jesus is the agent of creation. God creates the world through Jesus, and in that sense, he can be called the firstborn of creation um, because the, he's the agent of creation. Um, because it's it it follows in verse 16 where the hymn deals with his role in the creation of the world by him meaning Christ Jesus all things were created all right well that's a hard statement to make if you're just talking about a man who was born in Bethlehem at you know 6 BC <laughs> you know cuz cuz the world was around for a long long time you know <laughs> you know so you're saying like he was there at the big bang he he moved the thing on you know he started it happen the eruption of the the galaxies and all that stuff um no now christians are already saying that jesus was there at the very beginning of all things and for not just by him um but they were created for him whether in heaven or on earth so even the supernatural realm was created for Jesus or created by him. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, you have to understand this, uh, I'll explain this language because these are names of angels, in case you didn't know. Um, you know, there was a hierarchy of angels um, and they had different names for them. Some angels were defined as thrones, other were dominions, other were principalities, etc. Other were archangels, and they all had different functions. And people theorized about what their different functions were. But nevertheless, you know, they're they're beings of they're persons of rationality, but they just don't have bodies. So that's how they're different from us. They're like us, but they don't have bodies. So they're different in certain ways, like, you know, when they make a choice, they can't really change it, you know, because they, they don't change. They have, don't have bodies. We, we have matter which can change and changes all the time. We're changeable. 
Um, so, yeah, there he is. So Jesus, is, or so it's it's referencing angels here, and they use this language in the Catholic Mass. If uh, um, if you listen to the the new translation from, well, it's not that new; it's like maybe ten years old or so. Um, you know, the priest in the preface before the Lord's Supper, the reenactment of the Lord's Supper, you know, will say, you know, we come to you, Father, with praise and thanksgiving through your Son, through Jesus Christ, your Son, and we'll then we'll state something, a prayer, usually stating what the idea of the day is for the liturgy. Um, and then we'll say, you know, so we praise you and we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, through, through all, all the angels, or say all the thrones, all the dominions, all the powers of heaven praise you. It's referring to angels, different types of angels is what's going on there if you hear that in the preface of the Mass. Okay, so Paul is using this language too. Okay, Jesus all the angels, the supernatural powers were created for him because he's before them. He existed before them, obviously, if he made them. Um, and in him, all things hold together. So he gives consistency to the universe. It holds together in him. Now we have a mentioning of the church. Or it says combine or unite. Ah, anyway. Paul probably added this reference to the church. We're not sure if it's actually uh, in the original hymn, scholars debate, and that's fine. Um, but anyways, notice that the church is given some kind of pre-existence as well, because he's the head, the source of authority for the church. And as long as Christ exists, so does his body, the church. So in some mysterious way, the church has always existed as long as Jesus has existed, which is forever. The church has been there with Christ. He's the head of the church, um, even before its founding in some mysterious way. So he's the head of the church. Now we have something that is, seems to be a reference to the resurrection. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So he's the firstborn of the new creation, of those who will be born again. In, into eternal life, not into eternal death. Um, verse 19, interesting. Yes. Yes. All the pleroma, the fullness, the perfection of God dwell in him. But katiokeo, it's related to the, the, um, the word oikos, which means um, a house in, in Greek. So he is not just to dwell, he's like, He's dwelling in the body like a house. He's taking up residence, his household. Okay? Takes up household in him. The fullness of God takes up place in him. It makes its residence in Jesus. Jesus is the address now of God. You know, you ask God's, hey God, give me your address. I need to send you a letter. That's right. Jesus. There you go. Yeah. Nazareth. <laughs> in Galilee, all right? Um, but that's what he is. Plerum is a very interesting word for Paul to use because it, it's not a, you know, it, it's used sometimes in philosophy, in Greek philosophy and stuff to talk about the fullness that is the divine realm. Okay, the fullness of the supernatural realm. That now resides, katiokeo, in Jesus himself. So everything, both natural and supernatural, is brought together in Jesus. He is preeminent, as it says. Preeminent means to be, the, be first in rank or in importance. So I guess, you know, the overall point is, I, and hopefully we're seeing this, that already very early on, Christians had a, a high view of who Jesus was. Now, scholars will then debate, well, did Jesus have that high view of himself? And I think he did, because, and I've shown you in some ways how he talks about himself and things that he does. He certainly seemed to have no self-esteem problem at all. He was very sure of himself. Um, but where does the Messiah come in? Because Jesus is called Jesus the Christ. He's not called Jesus God. He's called Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Where does that come into play? What's the Messiah? Lord of the I've told you this before, I think. I don't know if I gave you the actual definition. Did I miss Cohen? Did I give you the actual definition of Messiah? Do you recall? Yeah. Ms. Murray, you did? God bless you, Ms. Murray. Are you taking notes? 
Stop that. What's wrong with you? No one else is taking notes. But, uh, well, I shouldn't say no one else, I because uh, some of you are taking notes. God bless you, my people. I, I appreciate it. I'm sure it happened to Jesus, too. It's like, you know, St. Matthew is the apostles there. It's like, oh, another parable about seeds. All right. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. The Messiah, a descendant of King David, okay, this famous king of the Jews who reigned over a unified Israel, a descendant of King David who would come back, he would come at the end of time to restore that kingdom. So he was a political leader who would defeat the enemies of Israel and establish a reign of peace based on the faithful observance of God's holy law. Okay. So there's also a religious element. You know, there's re it's very difficult to separate the Jewish king from religion, politics and religion. Well, for, in a lot of ancient cultures, there was really not a separation of religion from politics. People just didn't think of it that way. And the Jews were no different. The, the Jewish king was an agent of God. He was a son of God. Okay, he was anointed by God in his role. The word Messiah that we have doesn't, it comes from Hebrew, but actually it comes, the word we have in English comes from Aramaic, Meshicha, Meshicha, which is related to the Hebrew word Mashiach. Masha means to anoint, to pour oil over something. God bless you. If you Masha, okay, pour oil, embrocate, if you're doing nursing, I think they call it. But anyways, whenever you have to put balm or oil on somebody, you know, you're anointing them with solve or something that heal their wounds okay and they did this in the ancient world and they did this to anoint kings and priests and prophets maybe i'll get to that in a second um yeah christ so we gotta work christ and we already know this because i went over this before um when i started talking about jesus's ministry he's called the christ his title not his surname which translates Messiah because it means exactly the same thing, chrio, to rub with oil. So it's the same thing as Masha, just in Greek. So it means anointed one. So Jesus, the anointed one, you could say. And as I said, the anoint people who were anointed in Israel and Jewish culture, um, three people, priests, were anointed with oil, Ms. Tumulti. They got the oil poured on their heads and all over their garments and stuff. Prophets are said to be anointed by God. Um, Psalm 105, verse 15, in case you're interested. Psalm 105, verse 15, talks about prophets being anointed. And certainly kings were anointed. Kings had oil poured over their head and garments. Okay. Did anyone see uh, the coronation of Charles III? Anyone watch that on TV? No British monarchy fans. Shame on you Americans. I mean, didn't we fight a war with them or something? Did we, were we... Weren't they oppressors? Now it's like, you know, Megan and what's his name? Harry. Who's not even part of the royal family technically anymore, but people go nuts over it. George Washington is shivering in his grave, Mr. Robles. This is what I fought for. <laughs> English tea houses in there. And no one watched the coronation. I watched a little bit of it. I didn't watch all of it. Um, but if you had watched it, and you can see it, I'm sure, on YouTube, I'm sure there's a video of it, of uh, Charles becoming Charles III, King of England. And this happened to his mother as well. I mean, Elizabeth was notable because her coronation was the first one televised, um, and it was in color. So that was a big deal. Elizabeth II, um, who died a few years ago, may she wow. rest in peace. Um, and they they imitate that that uh, you know in the medieval period they love to do like Old Testament stuff, and so they imitate that. So the kings and queens of England are are anointed, and they have oil poured all over their head and all over their garments, just like the king of Israel. Um, so you would have seen that practice being done or imitated if you watch it on YouTube or whatever. But it was interesting because in the case of Queen Elizabeth II, they wouldn't show it on television. It would, the BBC or whoever the network would not show it because it was considered such a sacred moment. 
It was so important that they did they cut away when they actually did that. The Archbishop of Canterbury, I think, pours oil, poured oil over the head of Elizabeth, uh, anointing her as king, not her queen, excuse me, of the United Kingdom. I don't know if they showed it with Charles, because I only watched a snippet of it. I didn't watch the whole thing. Um, but anyway, so kings, kings, priests, prophets. Oh, there we are. Priests, prophets, and kings. If you want to look up the references, you can see here. Now, the idea of a king savior who would come at the end of time is not especially... Um, clear in the Old Testament per se. It's a development that happens within Judaism. Um, oh, wait a second. Um, and it will especially, it's a, a kind of a late idea in Judaism as well. It only becomes a very clear, crystallized idea that people, Jews, are believing in sometime around the Judahite exile in the 500s BC. Okay, um, what happens? Well, I'm going to tell you what happens, but to go into that, I have to go into a little bit of history of Israel, and that's going to take more time than I have now. So I'll end here, and we'll come back to it on Thursday. God bless you all. Who is Jesus? Ah, there we go. I don't have a map. Need a map. Oh, there it is. Okay. Excellent, sir. There you are. There he is. How's it going, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you. You're welcome, miss. Have a good day. Thank you. You're welcome, Miss. Have a good day. Have a good day, sir. Let's just Hello, Miss. Yeah. Hold on. Let me give me one second, sir. I want to turn off my recorder.